This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. So it's just a few days away from Halloween, and even our furry friends like to get into the spirit. So we have some tips to keep your pets safe during Fright Night. Also, our guest today, a true friend of the program, Nicole Smith, the Special Events Coordinator at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. We'll learn about their Park After Dark event happening this weekend and some of the other events coming up at the museum. And as always, Dr. Major is on hand, ready to take your pet questions. So if you'd like to join the conversation, just give us a phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven. 672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. And if you miss your Creature Comforts broadcast on Thursday, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning. Libby, uh, let's uh, start with you. What have you been noticing in your yard out and about uh, this time of year? Well, this is, what can we call this, end of summer or sort of the end of summer, I've heard people say, or... Um Kind of fallish weather compared to a, a lot of the country, but I've been um, watching invertebrates, our spiders. You know, we've talked about spiders a lot um, uh, the last couple of weeks, I think. And um, I went outside to see how my uh, yellow garden spider, the argiope, was doing. She's right by um, the room that I use a lot. And so uh, she, this morning, instead of being all spread out, you know, big and glorious with all those legs out, she was like this. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's just how I woke up, I think, this morning. <laughs> all oh, for the listening on it, she was all curled up in a little ball, no <laughs> legs extending at all, freezing there. And there was a third egg case. Mm. So she's really a healthy big girl and she's in a great place to catch insects because she's by a um a light she she keeps her web up i think all night you know mostly those spiders will eat their web and then re re-spin it in the mornings but i don't ever catch her without the web and i think it's because she's by a porch light and they're smart enough to know those kinds of things, so she's always full of... So anyway, that's going on. The spiders are laying their egg cases and um, kind of, I guess in a way, nature has had them kind of plan their own demise, so they they set things up for the babies and they move on along. Uh, walking sticks do the same thing, you know, those big old... A lot of people tell me, oh, I don't ever see those as an adult, but yes, because when we were kids, we could find them. But they have some winter strategies, too. They lay their little eggs that look like BBs, shiny little BBs in the dirt, and um, they, um, they get ready to pass on to the next generation. So usually, this is a time of year where if you find one, you can find a great big one, the great big females. They're laying their eggs. So Libby, it's funny you say that because um, we actually got an email recently about a, a, a walking stick sighting. Mm-hmm. And Kevin, Kevin has that. Yeah, this uh, says about a month ago. So this was in September, early in the morning. Got in my car, started it, and checked the rear view mirror when I backed up. Wow, this is what I saw in the mirror, a large walking stick. Stole it, got out, took the photo, then gently moved it off the mirror. The width of the glass of the mirror at the widest part was seven and a half inches. I've seen walking sticks in the past, but never one that big. So thought she would uh, share it from uh, with Creature Comforts, and that's uh, a listener in Hattiesburg. Oh, so, well, that, so objects in mirror really are larger uh, than you would think. So. Sometimes. <laughs> huh? Well, that was right on cue. I appreciate that caller. And uh, it, I guess if anybody else is seeing anything with their summer insects they might want to let us know you know there are um we have a couple of butterflies we may have more i'm not a great butterfly expert richard brown might be listening to us out there he can call in but um our comma butterflies and morning cloaks i know that those two overwinter as adults which i think is kind of neat those fragile little butterflies and they look for cracks in the bark and all kinds of things morning cloaks are very northern we're just kind of the 
the warmest place that they're going to occur. And um, I've read about a little bit about them because um, I have always been interested in them. They're uh, a, a, just a very different butterfly, and they're one of the first things we see. They're black butterfly, and then the edges of their wings are... Um, tipped in kind of a golden yellow as the summer goes on it'll fade to kind of white and then they have a little string of blue pearls right by the yellow so a beautiful butterfly and dark like that they bask in the sun and collect heat because they live in northern climates and um, particularly Scandinavia even. So they're, in fact, they're kind of revered there. Finland protects them. Austria and Germany protect them. So they're, they're animals that they really love. And I imagine in, in a more cold climate like that, it's really special to have a butterfly that will be out even when there's snow on the ground. So we're their most um, kind of most southern place. And then uh, I want to mention another butterfly that I have never seen in Mississippi yet, the zebra long wings. And I guess I'm old enough to remember when you could only find them in North America, the tip of Florida and, you know, southern Florida and southern Texas. And they're marching <laughs> north because uh, we're getting warmer. So I guess the, the two are going to meet here, morning cloaks and zebra <laughs> wings. We'll see if they get along. But uh, somebody posted a really good picture of a zebra wing from southern jo- Jones County. So that's, what's that, close to Hattiesburg so, yeah. mm-hmm. area, that kind of a thing, which is, um, and I think before they'd only been found along the coast, or to my knowledge, they had only been found along the coast. So that's something if you're on the coast to start looking for. And the the zebra long wing, you know how uh, um, they're like a horizontal look, so they're long this way. They've got really long, kind of narrow, long wings, and they're uh, beautifully, they're a, a black butterfly again with um, a really pretty white stripe, very bold striping. Good so I'm going to be, every time I'm a little bit further south of here looking for them, maybe I'll live to see them come all the way to Jackson area. And Libby, I think you had an event you wanted to talk about. Is that right? Oh, let's see. All right. Of course, I'm going to let Nicole do all the talking about the event at the Museum of Natural Science. But if you're in the Grenada area, I, a, a friend of this show and of the museum, Robin Whitfield, uh, we love her. She's awesome. Yes, she <laughs> does stuff all over the state. She's a, a, a naturalist and a, an artist, and she pretty much runs the Lee Tart Nature Preserve just outside of uh, Grenada in the, the Chachuma Marsh or swamp. swamp. Chachuma Swamp. Yes, so she's having events there at the swamp, and I particularly was interested in them because they're outdoor. They're great ha- Halloween events all over the state, but these are such cool outdoor kind of events. They're going to be dealing with bats uh, this coming Friday night, and then Dragon Spirits Enchanted Trails, and um, uh, Freedom Ranch Wildlife Center is going to come over and help her with and have a crow and a rat and all kinds of Halloween-y type things in addition to their regular owls. And uh, so that'll be happening Saturday. So if you're in that area, uh, that's a, a great event that mixes up Halloween with being outside, too. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Uh, good morning, Dr. Major. We have an early pet question on the line for you. So let's say good morning to Charlotte in Hattiesburg. Go ahead, Charlotte. You're on the air. Hi. Um, I have two beautiful large dogs, um, an American Bulldog and a pit bull mix. And they have always gotten along wonderfully, but recently have started fighting and um I'm wondering if their relationship can be salvaged or if they just don't like each other anymore. How old are they? Um, one is three years old and the other one just turned one recently. Okay, so you got a three-year-old and a one-year-old? That's right. A, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Yeah, 
not like each other now. Hey, Dr. Major, we're having a little trouble hearing you. Okay. Let's see. Maybe that is that better? Uh, much better. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. Uh, sounds like it may be a dominance issue uh, with the younger dog, maybe trying to uh, become the dominant uh, part of that family, if you will. Uh, I would seek professional help. Maybe a trainer would help uh, to work this out with you. Usually with dogs that are in a household together, uh, food or affection can cause some issues. In other words, if you're showing more attention to one than the other. Uh, have they both been neutered? Um, yes. And so the aggression actually started happening after the younger one got neutered and then he hurt his paw. So I think he, he felt defensive because he was hurt. Right. Yeah. Listen. Yeah, it's hard to give you uh, without seeing the dogs, certainly. Uh, I would suggest trying to find a trainer that can help you with that. I believe the relationship can be salvaged uh, with some work, okay? Good luck to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for your call, Charlotte. Let's uh, get one more call in before our first break. Our friend Sue down in Beaumont. Good morning, Sue. You're on the air. Hey, I I wanted to ask you to be something. Okay. Hey, Sue. I wasn't going to call today, but... It, my daughter came the other day, and a, one of those walking sticks jumped on her off the screen door, and it scared her to death. I haven't seen one in a long time, so she she slapped it off of her, but she didn't want to kill it. She just picked it up off the off the ground there and on off the carport and put it out on on the grass. So I thought that was nice of her because it scared her to death. <laughs> yeah, you know that's what I've always tell people. It doesn't matter how much you like an animal; you don't really want to be frightened by it. You don't want to be surprised that quickly. And I want to ask you something about spiders. Okay. You hit on two things I read. Okay, the other day I opened the back door about two weeks ago and there was this tarantula looking black spider right there in the door and I killed him because, you know, but anyway, the, the spider, I've never seen a totally black downsized looking tarantula spider out in the wild like that and then uh, last night the lights went off and uh, I, put, I turned on a lamp and there were two black Two of those black spiders, smaller ones, up on the ceiling. What kind of spiders are those? I've never, I've never seen a spider like that before. Totally black, but they've got those tarantula-looking legs and everything. Okay, and is he kind of hairy-looking and yeah. kind of stocky body? Probably mm-hmm. was a wolf spider, and there are several types of wolf spiders, but that's probably what he was. They're really good hunters, as you might get from their name. And as the bugs come indoors, though they're... Their predators will come indoors, too. So, in fact, Jason Klein and I were just talking. This is a time of year when wildlife sometimes wants to come in with us. They, you know, they sense the warmth of our house, and if they can get in, they will. So that might be what attracted your wolf spider. If he was chasing some little insects that were coming in the house, then he's going to certainly come in to find them. Will, will they bite a human? I mean, are they are they dangerous or anything? He, they are not dangerous, and they certainly don't want to bite They look you. dangerous. Yeah, they, they are, yeah. And they do have a bite that is pretty dangerous if you're a half-grown cockroach, you know. <laughs> so, um, and if you picked him up and tried to enclose him in your hand, he might bite you. So, you, you know, I would say if you want to move him outside – Scoop him up on two pieces of paper, you know, and walk him to the door. And or, a cup. Yeah, a cup and a paper. It. That'll get you there. Yeah, that'll work <laughs> just fine. A jar, whatever you've got, your drinking glass. But uh, they, no, they're basically, they're a good spider, I think, because they're going to eat, um, you know, the cockroaches that come in. If, he, if you find him in the corner over there, I like to think, well, okay, you just finished off one of those little cockroaches that was over there <laughs> earlier. So... It's um, I, I can't say any spiders are really bad because they they eat things that we usually don't want around. So I, 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 I usually don't bother little critters like that. I mean, you have spiders and things, but I've never seen one that looks so much like a tarantula. <laughs> yep, that's got to be him than a wolf spider, I would imagine. No, well, they, do so they much. have a webbing? I can't remember if a wolf spider has a web or not. I thought they didn't, but it's been a while since I've thought about them. I think they can make a little bit of a sketchy kind of web, but, but not, on the ground, like it's not like not. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're not. You're never going to find them up in a corner with a pretty 
web. Not like yeah. the orb weavers. No, they're There's not. There's so a- many types of webs. There's cobwebs and tangle webs and, you know, mm-hmm. you know, trap door. I mean, there's like, it's kind of fun just yeah, to study types of webs. And those funnel webs, you know, that's yeah. very Halloween-y. Some people the, have posted those the already. The bowl and doily week. webs, those are fun. We mm-hmm. we always think of them like when we're children. We see that picture of the orb web, and that's our memory of a web. But really, it's so much more complicated than that. Like Dr. Brent Hendrickson has come to the museum before and done guided spider hikes, and we have way too much fun, especially if you're like five years old and you're at that eye level where you can see everything, and they find webs that like I only dream of finding because I'm way too tall for all that (laughs) and it's just amazing to see what they come up with and I just love that you know there are a lot of spiders that are ground level yeah there really are because they're they they uh the funnels and the trap doors and all those cool things are on the ground because they're getting ants a lot of them yeah All right, uh, Sue, thanks for your call. Always good to hear from you. It is time for our first break of the hour. When we turn, we'll have Nicole Smith, Special Events Coordinator from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, join us to give details about their upcoming Park After Dark event. Dr. Major will be here throughout the hour, ready for your pet questions, and Libby always likes to hear about your brushes with wildlife. Call in with your questions and comments. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. Hi, I'm Ryder Taff, co-host of Money Talks. Each week, we take your personal finance questions and tell you about a money topic we hope you find helpful. Podcasts can be found on our website or on your smart device's podcasting platform. We're back on Creature Comforts. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and today we're uh, visiting with Nicole Smith from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. If you want to join the conversation with your question or comment, the phone number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Got a couple callers holding, but let's uh, take a few minutes to visit with Nicole. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good to have you back on the show, Nicole. Uh, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. So Park After Dark, uh, what and where is Park After Dark? Woo-woo. Park After Dark. (laughs) So uh, this is an event that we've done with the Children's Museum. So the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science and the Mississippi Children's Museum team up. And together we go in for Halloween. And so this year it's going to be this Friday. And it's from 5.30 p.m. until 8.30 p.m. You can buy tickets through the the Children's Museum's website. Just Google them, and you'll get right to that site. And it's one ticket, both museums, for the night. And it's a capped attendance to help with COVID safety. So that way, only so many people here between the two museums. That helps a great deal. And we kind of celebrate all things spooky fun for Halloween. And since we're the Science Museum, we kind of lean on the science side of it. Bats, we got you. Spiders, we're buddy. I mean... We own Halloween. Who are we kidding? We got this, right? <laughs> and, um, but this year, we decided to do something really different. And at our museum, we're going all in on a Wizard of Oz-inspired theme. Uh, we have the Wild Weather exhibit. And um, weather's a great natural science topic to learn about. So we thought, what is wild weather at Halloween? Clearly, it's Dorothy going to Kansas from Kansas to Oz. So we've got a Wizard of Oz feeling. And uh, so we will have, what creatures are we going to have? Well, we've got flying monkeys. <laughs> I mean, straight up, we got some flying monkeys that we constructed. And we'll do air cannons to learn about air pressure. We've um, got Oz CSI, so we'll have a crime scene investigation of who killed the Wicked Witch. There's a blurry photo of the perpetrators and fingerprints that you're going to have to use to identify. And it's going to be a whole fun thing. So we've really kind of had way too much fun putting this together. And... Um, I, you'll love it. I mean, it's totally worth your time <laughs> to come out for that. But get your tickets in advance because it is an advance-only sort of situation. And uh, Children's Museum's got fun stuff. They have, like, um, I think they have a little costume contest that they run. And then uh, ours is, like, multiple stations. A lot of it outside, or at least a certain portion of it outside. Glinda the Good Witch is making bubbles, of course, because she travels by bubbles. So we'll be doing that. And then we also have, um, we do it differently, our Dorothy. Instead of having a dog Toto, we have an opossum Toto. (laughs) 
because that's how we roll. And uh, and the horse of a different color, we have a skunk of a different color. We have a raccoon of a different color. We're, we're doing some ex- color experiments on our albino specimens, which is going to be kind of fun uh, activities with prisms. I mean... You just got to see it to experience it. Like if you look at our Facebook page, you're going to see some of the photos of what this is starting to look like. So it's really fun. (laughs) All right. Um, We'll be visiting with Nicole throughout the hour. We do have a couple callers to get to, though. So let's uh, first go back to the phones. Off to Carrollton we go. Fletch is on the line. Good morning, Fletch. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, I got a couple of, um, as Libby said, uh, invertebrate encounters. I saw a brown praying mantis for the first time ever, I think, about a week ago. I don't ever think it's pretty one. Yeah, I've, I have seen, you know, and I should know why. I'll have to do some reading. I'm not sure, but every now and then you do get a brown instead of a green one. I figured it was just matching the foliage. Um, yeah, it could be an end of the end of life kind of thing, too. Okay. Well, my other encounter was not so pleasant. I was cleaning my in-laws' gutters and uh, I got a, 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 a bite, a sting. I, it felt like a, a, like a fire ant, uh, but up that high, I didn't see any ants. Um, I did see an old wasp coal, but um, never saw a wasp. Um, and it swole up a lot more than, than normal. It's been uh, five days and uh, I'm starting to get a little head. Could it have been a spider? Well, <clears throat> okay, I guess the the worst kind of spider bite you can get is a brown recluse, but you don't feel them at all when they bite. That's what I thought. So you do feel a, 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 um, a black widow, but you usually have stomach distress with that. You usually throw up, or a lot of people do, and have fever. So I really wonder... Still, if it's not a, a wasp or a fire ant, and and it may be important to note too that when you look at the affected area, if you're really uncertain of what bit you, it's probably good to get checked out by a doctor anyway because staph infections can accompany bites. You know, um, you know, and that staph is very very common. You know, it's not that it's just specific to the animal; it's just general in the world. And so, uh, a bite would definitely warrant being visited by your doctor. Yeah, a bite or a sting, if it was, that is, yep, that's always possible that there's an infection. Is it real red around the area, swollen it part? Was, it was about the size of the palm of your hand, the area that was swollen. Um, it's not super red, but, but almost like a pimple, there is now a red area with a black center. Oh, Yeah, you might go in. They're going to ask you if it's a recluse, but if you felt it sting or bite at the time, that's not what it is, yeah. Uh, I definitely felt it, but I never saw the perpetrator. <laughs> yeah, Ooh, that is a mystery, and I, um, be really careful going back up there. I know All that, right. that okay. fire ants will go anywhere where you've got a, a mass of moist leaves and things, which would be a gutter, too. I've definitely seen plenty of ants in gutters. I just didn't see it this time. Yeah, it didn't this time. I'm sorry that got you. Uh, yeah, they like elevated areas, too, looser soils they seem to prefer. Yeah. All right, uh, Fletch, thanks for the call. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Fletch. Recommend yeah. uh, getting that checked out. So that, that, that does sound like a rather large area of... Uh, of the injury there, so uh, hope 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 all works out well. And I'll add one more event, but it's it's down now. I still can't wear my rings. You know, I had the wasps and the fire ants as of last week, and Monday I managed to step on a yellow jacket nest, <laughs> and so I got on my ankle and my hand. It's just kind of a weird thing. I don't know. I'd made the mistake of saying that I'd had, because I've got chiggers, I've had mosquito bites, the wasps, the fire ants, so I said, okay, I'm done now. And then I got the yellow jacket, so there could be something else out there for me, but this hand particularly swelled up, and I got my rings off in time, so, but it's, I I don't know what's happening out there. Everybody's, everything was a little mad at me at the end of summer. (laughs) 
So uh, we are visiting uh, on Creature Comforts with Nicole Smith from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. We've been talking a little bit about their Park After Dark event that's coming up this Friday from 5.30 to 8.30. It's in conjunction with the Mississippi Children's Museum. And, Nicole, what I love about when you come in and tell us about the events and is that it's not just fun, but it's also something where you can teach kids about science and that sort of thing. If you could maybe give us a little insight as to how you go about trying to get something that's A, fun, and B, educational. Um, My normal litmus test is if my inner (laughs) 12-year-old is giggling (laughs) and just enjoying the process of building these things too much, then I know I've got a winner. (laughs) So uh, right now, when we started talking about a Wizard of Oz theme, I I thought, man, I really want to do some sort of weather education, but I want it to feel like a Halloween carnival. What do I do? And it hit me. Flying monkeys. I need flying (laughs) monkeys, and I need to build an air cannon. And and I actually have built air cannons before, and it's great because air can exert pressure. And so it comes across as a game where you're trying to move these uh, little dangling flying monkey things that we put around the ceilings. But as you, like, move it and kind of... um, alter the position of the of the cannons you can really make that thing kick and it's hilarious and the kids don't expect it and when you get to them you can like blow them in the face with that thing and they like <laughs> they kind of look shocked you know i'm like haha air has force and pressure <laughs> is it kind of one of those things like you use in a swimming pool uh sort of but we we built them out of uh old 10 gallon pickle barrels but we I know it's a thing, and uh, and and Karen is like remarkably talented, uh-huh. and so she went the next level and made them look like actual cannons. She like built bases for them with like rolling wheels and every. It's crazy. It's just, okay, I'm coming by today. Yeah, the show. it's it's pretty cool, and uh, and then of course. Uh, I've always, as a child, I was fascinated by the horse of a different color in Oz. And I said, oh man, colors. This is an opportunity to learn about prisms. How are we going to do that? And then we started looking at our inventory, like, well, we have this albino raccoon and we have this taxidermed albino, you know, skunk. And that's a good blank platform to project things on. So we. Do, doing some fun color projections there, but he said, well, let's go to the next level. Let's make it interactive. So we've kind of constructed a, a pinhole viewer that utilizes prisms, uh, and, and so you start playing with how the light is going to be divided. And, of course, there's the rainbows in Oz, somewhere over the rainbow. So we have this, like, little moment of Roy G. Biv <laughs> <laughs> using prisms and utilizing the um, the specimens that we have Not just to talk about what they are, but also to talk about properties of light, which is, you know, a little bit of physics, but a little bit of natural science, too. So, yeah, you're going to learn something, but you're also going to have fun doing it. And then just for the giggle of it, we have, like, straight up uh, a carnival game where we've constructed a tree from the wicked trees in Oz. And you throw the apples through the little carnival game, but the tree might throw some apples back at you (laughs) because that's how it is in Oz. So having fun. (laughs) All right. It's uh, time for another break. When we turn, we'll continue talking with our guest, Nicole Smith, Special Events Coordinator at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. If you visited the museum recently and you want to call in and share your story, we'd love to hear from you. Also, we're here for your pet questions and any other comments or questions that you have for us today. The number to call, 1-877-MPB-RING. It's 1-877-672-7464. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson. Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, and Nicole Smith, special events coordinator at the Museum of Natural Science. It's Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. If you missed any of today's show, you can always subscribe to our podcast using your favorite podcasting app, or you can download the MPB public media app. To join the conversation, it's a phone call, 1-877-MPB-RING, 1-877-672-7464. Email animals at mpbonline.org. Had some callers holding on for us a little while. Let's return again to the phones. John's in Jackson. Good morning, John. 
Hello there. I'd like to address this to the lady who saw a tarantuloid spider and a walking stick on her screen. Yes. I'll bet she had the privilege of seeing one of our trap door spiders. These belong to the same general group as the tarantulas. They're, they're black. Their legs are uh, thicker and shorter than the wolf spiders. And the males come out and wander about, amorously looking for females. Uh, what they do for a living is actually make little hinged lids over pits in the soil and lie and wait for insects that fall in. Mm. Uh, they, they turn up on on screens looking very tarantula and very dark. I bet she saw one of them. And uh, as far as the walking stick is concerned, that one uh, species of walking stick in the area is one of the, the very few insect visitors you have to be very careful with. We have two types of walking sticks here. We have a long, skinny one, which is more like a walking twig. We have a thick, heavy-bodied one, uh, which may mate for days, and you often encounter a larger female with a smaller uh, male in copula. At any rate, if you get behind one of these creatures, like many essentially harmless animals, they can squirt a very irritating chemical stream right into your face, and it can uh, blind you temporarily. So uh, be very careful about uh, short fat, amorous-looking walking sticks. All right, John, thanks uh, for the call. Good to hear from you this morning. Let's uh, stay on the phone lines. Next, we're off to Kosciuszko. TJ is on the line. Good morning, TJ. You're on the air with us. Yeah, good morning. Love your show. Thank you. I wonder if any of your people have heard of a bug called a, a cow killer. We have them up here in central Mississippi. I got them in my barnyard, and it's a it's a flightless wasp. <clears throat> yes. Yes. Let me tell us about it. Yes, yeah, some people call it a velvet ant. That's yep. that's what I was taught as a child, or a cow killer. And um, <clears throat> there are red ones, and there are black ones, and there may be other colors. I, and I don't know a lot about them, but they are really interesting. And I did pick one up and get bitten by it or stung by it as a child. It's part of your collection oh, of no bites surprise. and things that yes. you've been working yes. on for a while yeah, now. for a long time. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, all right, what, what color was the one you saw? Red, and the old-timers tell me that they call them cow killers because it'll sting a cow and drop him to his knees. You know, I wonder if that's true, if anybody knows if that's a, a true story, but they, it really does hurt. It really hurts a lot when they get you. But um, it is pretty big, and yeah. it's best to just stay away from them. Don't try to yeah. don't try to collect it or put it in your jar. Is what I would say, right? Yeah, I've got them in my barnyard, and I'm scared to uh, lay down in the gravel out there and work on something. I don't want them to sting me. <laughs> oh, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, you kind of scuff up the area before you lay down and look over okay. it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> They're such yeah. beautiful insects, you know. Now I, they are gorgeous. Yeah. You know, when I was yeah. a child and saw one for the first time, I I really thought, well, that's a fancy ant, you know. Yep. Uh, yeah. And they kind of look like a fancy ant, but uh, but they're more like yeah. a, a relative of an ant. They are yeah. a wasp. So. And the name velvet is good because they they are beautiful and velvety, and that's why I think children do want to pick them up because mm -hmm. they're they're oh, not. To me, they were not ominous looking at all. They're pretty big. <clears throat> and They're, that's right. Yeah. I'm going to need a local artist to make some jewelry that looks like that because it's pretty awesome yeah. looking. It's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for letting us know about seeing one. Yeah, I'll get my sister to make you one. She's a, she's a jewelry maker. Oh, I right. like it. That good, sounds good. good. You've probably got some cool <laughs> spiders in the same barn. Yeah. You know, I never had them in my barnyard till I brought my donkeys in. And I guess they like to fertilize or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, and there they came. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, TJ, good to hear from you. Thanks for calling in this morning. Uh, this is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Our guest is Nicole Smith, Special Events Coordinator at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. We've been talking about Park After Dark, their big uh, Halloween-related celebration with the Mississippi Children's Museum. That's this Friday from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. Nicole, you wanted to talk about safety measures put in place. Absolutely. So, um, so first of all, we did set uh, a general 
uh, only a set number of tickets available, and you you buy that online just to help with safety because that helps with social distancing. You know, if you're crowded in, you can't social distance so much, so this helps a little bit. Uh, Another nice thing is... uh, they have been working on that new playground. Now, it's not done, but they have uh, really worked on that sidewalk. And so they have uh, – there's going to be a light. It's one big light uh, that lights up that pathway so people can walk easily from the Children's Museum to ours. And that's, you know, a little bit more convenient. Open air, well, a little, it's a very short distance. You can walk from one museum to the next. There will be a, a shuttle bus for those that need it, and they're um, – And there is a mask requirement on a bus. That's a federal thing. So you have to wear a mask on the bus. Masks are strongly recommended in the facilities. And we have put several activities outside. So we uh, keep each other safe by kind of doing all these things together. Uh, So just kind of keep that in mind. We are really trying, but it it comes down to us as a community how we respond. And it's going to be a beautiful night. Uh, We're trying uh, to add things and move things and place things in a way that makes it a a responsible evening of fun and uh, we hope that you will get your tickets and come on out all right Uh, so let me you know this morning i had to go into my drawer and pull out my sweatshirt things are getting cooler and that's the way we kind of deal with it Uh, but what about uh, some of the animals around mississippi how do they react to this cooler weather i think I think most of our mammals really like it. Probably all of our mammals really like it. Um, Some of the pests that have plagued them, you know, mosquitoes drive mammals nuts too, so that's a good thing. Flies, things like that, so they they have less of that to worry with. Speaking as a mammal, I am very, (laughs) very glad for the lack of uh, mosquitoes. Definitely, yeah. Yes. They're, uh, you know, they can... They're get, uh, walking around in fur coats, so it's it's pretty good for them. Uh, some of the birds tend to like cool weather, I think, but, you know, so many have gone south now. We A lot of our birds, they started migrating a couple of months ago, so they've gone south if they don't care for winter weather. Oh, gosh, let's see. We're going to – we'll be getting all of our little winter birds back, like the kinglets – I haven't seen a kinglet yet. Somebody call if they've seen ru- uh, ruby-crowned or golden-crowned kinglets because they they should be here. That's, I haven't seen any I, I yet. I need to start. Yeah. And I need to – you've got to really listen to get that little high, wispy little sound. They tend to be in the tops of trees and make a real high-pitched, uh, you know, pretty little whistly sound. And um, let's see. All right, what else? Well, the, we've talked about the, the fact that the insects – are reptiles. They're not so much into cold weather. They're pretty much adapted to bask in the sun. Mm -hmm. So when you're going to see them now is on a nice sunny day, which we have all through winter in the south. So you you could see snakes and turtles and alligators any time that the sun is out shining. And, you know, they'll tend to be on a, a a dark spot, a, a, you know, a rock that's heating up in the sun, something like that to find them. But basically, probably last night they they were looking for a burrow, somewhere good to get. And the alligators, we need to get Ricky Flint to come on and talk a little more about alligators for us. And uh, they're going to try to find a mud bank to dig back into our amphibians like cool weather. You know, the frogs are going to be so active in the spring. They're surprisingly to a lot of people, they're not like reptiles in that respect because they've got that dry, they've got that um, moist skin that needs to stay moist and a lot of their air oxygen exchanges through their skin. So they want to be in a moist kind of cool environment. So they'll, they're doing okay right now. When it gets too cold, they'll start burrowing into into the mud, too. All right, time for our last break for the hour. When we get back, we'll continue visiting with our guest, uh, Nicole Smith, from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Our friend Kathleen is on the line. We'll get to her phone call as well. Still time for you to call in if you have a question or comment. The phone number is 1-877-MPB-RING. It's one 877 Six seven two seven four six four. You can always email the show. Send it to animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more after this. 
On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Dr. Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, an associate professor of preventive medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Nicole Smith from the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Uh, we've got a caller on the line, and as I mentioned, Kathleen has held on for us. So good morning, Kathleen. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. Well, I had to say kudos to Nicole and the staff. That's this little thing that they're putting on. We need a smile, a laugh, a giggle, maybe a screech every now and then to kind of break things up. I'm going to give you a tip, uh, two tips, really. That One, what I did when I was my daughter was little, we made like a cardboard tunnel. And we blindfolded the kids, and we had a guy dressed up like a guard. And we said, don't worry, the spooks won't get you. He's there to protect you so they wouldn't get scared. But we had a tray, uh, an old refrigerator drawer, and we filled it up with tomato sauce and some stewed tomatoes and put grapes in it. We told them we saved the mummy's eyes for them to touch. And then when we walked a little further, we had balloons with cold cream on it. We told them this was decayed uh, monster skulls, and don't worry, they're already dead. And at the end, we had uh, shag carpet with the the long stuff aren't just junk stuff. We staple it all around. We tell them we've got to crawl out through the mummy's stomach. And I tell you, I don't know who had more fun, the kids or us adults, but uh, we yeah, had a little talk about it. Time. I'm pretty sure it was you because you sound awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I enjoyed it. But uh, I, got, I got a little tip uh, for people who have the ants and bugs, uh, bad critters in the yard, and you don't want to use chemicals, try vinegar. If you can buy four gallons of vinegar for what you'd pay for one of those uh, high uh, pollutant chemicals and stuff, mm-hmm. and I just spread the, the pile open and pour the uh, vinegar in, and they're gone, pecan. They're, mm-hmm. <laughs> they're not there anymore. <laughs> but I enjoy this, and I hope they have a full house because we need it. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Staff. All right, Kathleen, good to hear from you. Shag carpet. Boy, it's been a while since I've thought about that. I remember you had that rake that you had to do to, to uh, clean that. So Yeah, that could be a little scary, actually. <laughs> You're, she's right. The yeah. 70s were a little, yeah. I'm having a flashback to my youth for sure and uh, something, an incident with a vacuum cleaner, but it went down. <laughs> That's good. Um, so, Nicole, you mentioned Wild Weather, an exhibit that's uh, at the museum through the end of the year. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. It's awesome. Like It has been way too much fun. It's super interactive. It takes up all of our traveling uh, exhibit hall space. The exhibit hall in the atrium, part of it's upstairs, too. Like it's, and it's so much of it to see and do. There's like two different tornado stations where you can kind of alter the uh, the wind patterns and the flow patterns. You can even make splinter tornadoes with that. That's so neat. There's a lightning station where you can kind of increase the frequency of the lightning uh, and, and show kind of how it really works. Uh, my favorite part is the snow exhibit because you can set the temperature, the wind speed, and um, and a couple of other factors. And when you hit start, it has this enormous screen that shows you what the snowfall would look like. Mm. And I love that just by playing with it, it shows you what temperature does to the size of your snowflake. It shows you what wind can do to the effect of a storm. And I think that's just really engaging. And kids seem to love that thing. Like, we've had it for a while. It'll be here till the end of the year. But it's definitely something you don't want to miss. It's very interactive, and it's just such a cool, just such a very cool exhibit. Um, Also a photography exhibit at the museum? Right. So uh, Wesley Shoup, he comes, visits the museum regularly. We kind of love him, and he is quite a competent photographer. He has uh, visited the museum through the seasons, and he has photographed wildlife through all of the seasons. And this 
little exhibit is but a fraction of what he has documented life in the park and i love that it's completely local this is your backyard this is here for you to see sometimes people say oh well i've been to the museum before i'm like did you come in spring was it different in spring than it is in the summer when did you come in the fall? Because I mean, it's so different through the seasons, and I love the birders who come out and they and they say, "Oh, I saw that ruby crown kinglet, or I saw like that nesting pair of you know cardinals, whatever it is they see, they love to share with us." And I I love that. Here is the nature in your backyard. You don't have to go for like a great safari somewhere in another continent. It's right here for you to see. And it's such a beautiful thing. And the quality, and let's say you're not feeling getting on the trail, but you want to see the, his photographs, totally worth it. You definitely want to see Mr. Sheep's photos. All right. Now, remind us maybe a couple of your favorite uh, kind of permanent things at the museum. Oh. How much time you got? Uh, so <laughs> I am a fossil nerd from way back. So like my favorite things uh, really are about the fossils. So we have the state fossil of Mississippi on display. And not a lot of people know, but we have a state fossil. And it's uh, Zygoriza Koshi. It's this incredible prehistoric whale. Uh, but when you first look at it, kids are kind of like, is it a dolphin? What is it? Like they're not sure because he's kind of small, but he's bigger than a dolphin. They're, they're still trying to figure him out. And so I love the fossils because when you walk into the lower level, you start with the fossils and you can't go into your present or your future without understanding your past. So it makes complete sense to me that it really begins in the fossil wall area. You know, you look outside and see what trees are growing here. Those trees grow because that soil was created, you know, from our from our past. You see bamboo in places where it's silicious soil. You get silicious soil because there was, you know, an, a, an ocean environment in a place. It kind of informs the whole landscape. And that kind of gives the pathway for how you understand the exhibits in the whole museum. I think it's a beautiful thing. And I love the uh, the nature trails. We mentioned those a couple of times. But that's something that, uh, provided it's not too, too cold, that's uh, a lot of fun. Just been on a sweater. <laughs> Toughen up, Kevin. Come on. Let's go. Get your boots on. Let's get it. <laughs> All right. So we got about a minute left. If you would, remind us about details about the upcoming Park After Dark. Right. Park After Dark is this Friday. You can buy tickets through the Children's Museum's website. Uh, it will start at 530 And we have a lot to see between both buildings. Please um, get your ticket online and know that you can walk between both places. And if you need a little bus, there will be a little shuttle bus as well. And it's going to be a lovely evening. So I hope we see you there. All right. You know, I've been impressed that uh, very recently here we've gotten a lot of pictures, uh, folks uh, seeing things out and about and have uh, sent us pictures in. So we really love that. If you ever see a creature or something that you're confused about, don't know what it is and think that we might be able to help uh, try to and you have a smartphone, just go ahead, grab a picture of it and send it to us. And we'll get our team of experts working on it to let you know what that is. So uh, email us anytime at animals at mpbonline.org. That's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funding provided in part by listeners like you. And we appreciate everyone who made contributions during our fall fundraiser drive time last week. Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our call screener this morning was Liz Gill. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Nicole Smith, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to stay tuned. Up next, it's AutoCorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio.